Hello and welcome to Sunday Catch Up. I'm very pleased to welcome you to our online service at Holy Trinity Nails this Sunday. Of course, we're catching up from last Sunday when in church, Ruth was reminding us that God is love. We're beginning a new series exploring the character of God and what he's like. And where better to start than with his love. Um, as we begin, let's pray together, shall we? Our Father God, thank you that we can worship wherever we are, even online. Uh, we pray that you would speak into our hearts and our minds, that you might encourage us, teach us your ways and enable our worship. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to the weekly update. Today, the 8th of May, is the Toby Fun Day. This is in memory of Toby Riley, who tragically died last year, and his friends and family are organising a fun day to raise funds to build an activity area to promote physical and mental well-being. We as a church would like to give a donation towards this community initiative. As well as the normal collection, there is a basket on the welcome desk in the welcome area and you can give cash donations there. You can also give online and you can follow the link from the church news email. Talking about donations, we have also have a contactless donation machine that goes towards Holy Trinity and I'm going to show, show you how to use it now. I'm going to show you our contactless donations machine. As you can see, the machine is in our welcome area on the welcome desk and it is very easy to use. All you need to do is just press an amount that you would like to donate or choose your own amount. Then the machine will ask you for your contactless card. You put that to the top of the machine on the orange bit and it will take your payment. If the contactless bit does not work, you can open the lid and there is a slot at the back for you to put your card in and put your PIN number in. After that, it will ask you if you would like to gift aid your donation. If you would like to gift aid, you just fill in the form. If not, you press no thanks. And that's it. This comes from Hosea, the prophet Hosea in the Old Testament, uh, chapter 11. Hosea 11. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. But the more they were called, the more they went away from me. They sacrificed to the Baals, and they burnt incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms. But they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. To them I was like the one who lifts a little, a little child to the cheek, and I bent down to feed them. My people are determined to turn from me. Even though they call me God Most High, I will by no means exalt them. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I treat you like Admar? How can I make you like Zeboim? My heart is charged within me. All my compassion is aroused. The second reading is taken from the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 13. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. 
Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel round his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped round him. He came to Peter, Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realise now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part in me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, Those who've had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said, not every one was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand? What I have done for you, he asked. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Good evening, everybody. I'm Ruth Jolly. I'm a licensed reader here at Holy Trinity, and I've been given the huge privilege of kicking off our new study series in which we're going to be looking at who God is and what the Bible tells us he is like. And we're beginning this week, as James has already said, by remembering that above everything else, God is love. Not just loving, but love personified. And you could say that the whole of the Bible is a love letter from God to a broken world and to you and me as individuals. I hope that you were moved by those lovely words that Tim read to us from the less well-known prophet Hosea, verses which for me sum up more than anything else the love of God the Father for wayward humankind. The Old Testament, the first half of the Bible, is a great place for seeing and understanding the father love of God. Too often we view the Old Testament as being full of negativity, a document in which the people of Israel are constantly told off and punished by an angry God. And we miss the passages which show what is really God's plan for us and what he longs to do for us, if only we would let him. In those verses that we read from Hosea, the image is of a father with a stroppy toddler. And many of us who have been parents of stroppy toddlers or have perhaps observed others in that role will be able to identify with it all too easily. Come along, it's time to go out. Let's just get your coat on. No, I didn't say run away as fast as, come on, come here. And I can just see my little grandson running down the hallway, giggling wildly, while his frustrated father follows with the coat. When they were worshipping false gods, when they were um, worshipping the Baals, the, the gods of the surrounding nations, these Old Testament people were like a rebellious child. They knew perfectly well what they should be doing, 
but somehow doing something different seemed like more fun. And yet, says God in these verses, I was the one who taught them to walk. I held their hand. I kept them safe by tying them to me with cords of love. I lifted them up and cuddled them cheek to cheek. I stooped down to feed them. What grief I experience, says God, what yearning when they are determined to turn from me. But how can I give them up? How can I not love these my children? All my compassion is aroused. That is the way in which God loves us. And in the Old Testament, we see that expression of his love for the Jewish people, the nation chosen by him to show the rest of the world what it is like to be loved by God. Constantly failing, repeatedly having to be disciplined because discipline is love, rightly done. Constantly called back and restored, constantly rebound to him with cords of love and kindness. As it says in Psalm 103, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him, for he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. From everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him. And here's another passage which shows us how God loves us. This is from Jeremiah chapter 31. I have loved you, says God, with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. I will build you up again, and you, virgin Israel, will be rebuilt. Again, you will take up your tambourines and go out to dance with the joyful. And the God of the Old Testament is also the God of the New Testament. Exactly the same love is shown to us in Jesus. Because our God, it says in the letter of James, does not change like shifting shadows. Or in the old version, there is no shadow of turning in him. The God who loved the people of Israel with an everlasting love is the God who loves you. And so we see in Jesus exactly what we've already observed in God the Father. As the Father cries out in Hosea, how can I give you up? So the same agonized yearning can be heard in the cry of Jesus over Jerusalem, the holy city. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who are sent to you, how often have I longed to gather you together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. Another beautiful picture of God's love for us, a love that still leaves us complete freedom to accept or reject. Jesus told a story about a young man who was fed up with waiting for his inheritance and being a good and obedient son and wanted to have the money while his father was still alive so that he could live it up while he was still young enough to enjoy it. Like the Israelites in the Old Testament, he looked at the world around him and he knew how he should behave, but something different looked a whole lot more fun. And like some of today's lottery winners, he did the whole spend, 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 party, party, party thing until the money ran out and he was destitute. Oops. And so he had to crawl back home and he thought, well, I'll say to my father, really sorry, um, maybe I could be one of the servants. And the story shows very clearly how we need to turn away from a self-centered, me, me, me approach to life and turn ourselves towards the God who loves us so dearly. But the story also shows how we will be received when we do that. It shows the boy's father as so desperate to see his beloved son again that he runs to meet him. While he was still a long way off, says Jesus, his father saw him and was filled with compassion, that compassion word again, 
for him. And he ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. So the boy gasps out his pre-planned words of remorse and his hope that he might perhaps be taken back in some way. But while he's still speaking, the father is already planning the celebration party because his son has come home. Just as God said in the passage that I read just now from Jeremiah, I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. I will build you up again and you will be rebuilt and go out to dance with the joyful. For the love of God is a love that rebuilds and restores. In a graphic image of God from the prophet Joel, God promises to restore to us the years that the locust has eaten. Our famine, our personal famine, may be spiritual or emotional rather than physical, but the desert of the locust years will be restored and we will flourish. Only believe. As we look at Jesus throughout the accounts of his life in the New Testament, we see God going about our world and demonstrating love in every word and every action. Restoring and rebuilding lives is what Jesus is all about. And he views each person that he interacts with as a whole person. He doesn't look at you and see a set of symptoms or a problem that you have. He sees you, you, me. Watch him as he deals with a paralyzed man. We all know that he has the power to heal that paralysis. And ultimately, he does do so. But first, he addresses the man's greater need, which is to have his sins forgiven. See Jesus talk to the outcasts of society. Think, for example, of the woman that he met at the well, someone who was so aware of the unacceptableness of her way of life that she came to draw water in the heat of the day when she wouldn't have to put up with the neighbors pointing their fingers and wagging their tongues about her. Jesus didn't turn to her and tell her off for the way she was living. Instead, he drew her interest by promising her water that would never run dry. And gradually she came to understand what he meant by that and what it was she really needed. <coughs> Watch Jesus again as he interacts with Simon Peter, the man who boasted that he was willing to die with him and then denied three times that he ever knew him and ran away. Does, Peter say, does Jesus say, well, Peter, I'm disappointed in you. What happened to all those brave words then? You're no good to me. Not at all. He knows that Peter is already in pieces with grief at what he has done. And he gives him, quite specifically, three matching opportunities to undeny him. And then he goes on to recommission him to carry on his work in a broken world where the love of God is so needed. Rebuild and restore. Jesus' whole life was an act of love, making possible the rebuilding and the restoration that we all so desperately need. Our second reading today began with the lovely words, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And he went on, as we heard, to wash the hot, sweaty, dusty feet of 12 of his followers. But he went a lot further than that, didn't he? He went to the cross of Calvary because he loved us. God's love is not a warm, fuzzy feeling. It's an intensely practical and self-sacrificing love. Ultimately, it's a love that is prepared to bleed and die for our good. It's a love which never gives up on us, always tries one more time to reach out, restore, and rebuild. How do we react 
to this love that God so longs to lavish on us. Probably all of us in very different ways, because for some people, actually receiving love is extremely difficult. People who have been hurt and abused over and over again, for them to trust enough to accept God's love is excruciatingly hard. Others of us may perhaps take it quite for granted. Oh, yes, yes, God is love and he loves me. But we're not really receiving what he has for us. Or we may be holding him at arm's length, thinking, well, if I don't trust, then I can't be let down. Are we perhaps foolishly trying to put God off to a more convenient time, trying to have our bit of fun first and then let him put things to right? How ready are we to turn our own warm, fuzzy feeling about the love of God into costly, unappealing action? Do we realize that the love of God is a love which is prepared to bleed and die for those who need him so desperately? Are we listening to God to see where he wants to demonstrate that love through us, that love which we have because he first loved us. God is love. God doesn't just have love. He is love through and through. When Jesus said to follow his example, what implication does that have for us? Let's pray together. Lord, when we truly see how you love, we can only gaze in awe and wonder that you bother with us, that you care for us, that you lead us by the hand and draw us to you with cords of love and kindness, that you went to the cross for us and bled and died for us. Help us to receive your love in whatever way we need. In Jesus' name, amen.